Oh Lord, as we shift uh, from sending voices to you, Lord, we are taking the words of that song seriously. We're not just singing songs here, Lord. We're singing songs of purpose. And we, we are leaning in now for all that you'd have for us. And we, we mean it when we say everything else can wait. And so, Lord, we would ask that you'd help us with our distractions now as we seek to, to hear your voice. And all these voices that are calling for our attention, Lord, we ask that you'd help us to drown those voices out so we would only hear one voice. We are, we are a, a hurting people. We are people with great need. We are people with great uh, desires in our heart to do great things, but we are distracted and uh, sometimes filled with, with pain. And so there's just things in the way, Lord, and we want to come here today and, in, and we want you to increase our faith that we might uh, live with purpose. And, and so help us, Lord, to have ears to hear what you would have to say. And Lord, I pray that you'd remove me. I, I, am, I am in more need of you than probably anyone in this room and so, Lord, I don't want any of me to bleed into what you would have to say to your people. I am looking at those that are here today, and I recognize, by your grace, uh, some of the need that's here. And I also know what you have prepared uh, for me to say, and that is uh, an overwhelming thing because I know that, that you're here right now. And so, Lord, speak to your people today in a way that transforms the way they think therefore transforming the way that they live. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, guys. How is everybody today? You all right? You all right? You all right? Awesome. Good, 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 good. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, um, hey, listen. Um, I'm happy that you're here. It's good to see everybody. I, um, I want to say this uh, as I was starting out. I know that what I'm about to, to, to share with you this morning uh, when we get started here is something that you've all either personally experienced or if you haven't personally experienced this, you've no doubt uh, witnessed it on like a movie or maybe uh, a TV show. And it's, it's this. It's the picking of the teams at the ballpark. You guys know what I'm talking about? So we're going to play basketball or football or wiffle ball or whatever. Do you guys play wiffle ball down here? Is that a northern thing? Southerners know what wiffle ball is? Okay. So, so, so you're, you're in the playground, right? And, and, and so you get the two best players, right? The most talented, best looking, best built, fastest, tallest, strongest. And, and they're the captains, of course. And then so they start picking their teams, and they go through the group, and they go, and they look for the most, right, strongest, fastest, tallest, most talented, and they start picking those people, right? Well, hey, Colby, he looks big and strong and tall, right? We're playing basketball here, so I'm picking this guy for sure, right? And so you pick him, and then they look for, you're kind of tall, so we'll play. And, it, and maybe we're playing football, so I'm going to pick Gunhammer back there, because he'll mow you over if he get in his way, Right? So you start picking those guys, and that makes sense. And then they start going through the group, and they get the ones that aren't as, you know. And, and then they get down to the you, right? The rest of you, us, me, and, and just kidding. And, and they pick you because you're the last guy. Someone has to pick Steve. So I guess we'll let you play on our team. And then they walk away like this, you know. That's the way it happens. That's the way it works, right? And, and it's sad because you feel bad for the, the last kid, the last boy, the last girl. You feel bad for them, but you know that's the reality. And, and, and so, you know, nowadays they don't do that, right? Everybody gets, a, everybody gets a trophy. doesn't matter how good you play. You could be awful. You get a trophy. And what does that make the trophy guy feel like? Loser, right? I got a trophy. That guy got a trophy. We barely wanted Steve on our team. He got a trophy. He got the same trophy as me, and I'm a superstar. What's that make me feel like? <laughs> Socialism. So uh, anyway, <laughs> don't want to get political here. But, but listen, listen. So, and that happens, and that carries into the draft for NFL and NBA, right? So you don't see, like when you watch the draft on TV, right, you see the biggest, baddest, fastest, most gifted dude up on the stage. He's first pick. 
and second pick, right? And then as they get less qualified and less impressive, it goes down the list, and then they pick them, right? They need to have somebody. You give this guy a chance. Maybe there's a Tom Brady in there somewhere. That's what happens, right? It's not just in sports. It's in the, it's in the uh, real world where the rest of us live, in the workplace, right? So if you're hired, if you're a, an owner or a manager or, or a foreman or whatever, and you're hiring staff, employees, right? You don't, who's looking for the least qualified guy? No, nobody's doing that, right? You, look, you get some resumes, and you look for the one who's most qualified to do the job, right? That's what you would do. I got two words for you. But God. But God, right? God doesn't seem to work on that program, right? He always picks the ones that are unseen, unlikely, unpopular, uneducated, unqualified, unprepared, right? That's the ones he picks. Why does he pick that person? So that they won't get glory, right? He is a, he is a jealous God. He is, I'm going to, don't stone me when I say this. He's a selfish God. Not that he doesn't like to give and give and give. That's his nature. But when it comes to glory, how much glory is available for anything else in the universe? None. None. Right? He, I will not share my glory with another, says the Lord. Right? He does all this so that when you do something awesome, he can't look and go, well, that Meredith, she's pretty impressive. And you won't look at her and go, well, she's pretty impressive. No, you'll look at her and say, she's not very impressive, but God is impressive working through her, right? That's what will happen. So he picks people like Moses. We started this series two weeks ago, and we started studying about Moses, right? Moses, the, the felon. Moses, the fugitive. Moses, the, the one who was, was dumped into a river as a child, and, and maybe mom and dad loved him enough to stick him in a river, but for the child who gets put up for adoption, you don't feel that way. You feel neglected, like you're not loved, like you're not wanted. And then it, the Bible tells us that it was months before he was even given a name, a nobody, who kills a dude, runs off into the desert, and is a shepherd, a lowly shepherd for 40 years, 40 years he was doing nothing except being a shepherd. And God calls him from a burning bush. Go figure that one out. And then we studied about Rahab. She's not the nobody. She's, everybody knows Rahab in town. She's a, we could, I, I did a long explanation about who Moses is. Let me give you a real short one about Rahab. She's a hooker. She's a prostitute. And God uses her to advance his purposes. And so the reason why we're studying this message series is not that you would learn about Moses or Rahab, and that's super, super important. They made it to the Faith Hall of Fame. Like, of all the people that God has used in this world to redeem back a broken human race, there's a certain group that he took the time to list in his Bible as the superstars of faith. Like, hey, look at these guys. Look at these girls. Do like them. Okay, that's not saying you should be a prostitute. I'm just saying have faith and trust in God enough to do something about it. And so we're studying these people, not so you could praise them or what God did in their life, although we should. And we need to know history, right? We need to know history because we learn from history. We learn the nature and character of God by how he's done things in the past. And that's why we're studying this. We're studying it so that you could somehow see yourself in the story of Moses. That you could see yourself in the story of Rahab and see how God dealt with them so you could see how he would deal with you. Okay, That's why we study. And so today, we're going to study about this other unlikely hero, Gideon. Okay, Gideon. Now, earlier in the week, I made sure that our Facebook page had informed you that we're going to be studying about Gideon and that Gideon's story is found in Judges chapter 6, 7, and 8. Now, Judges 6, 7, and 8 is a long section of Scripture. And so, therefore, I think there's something really to be gleaned there. Why would God dedicate three full, script, uh, three full chapters of the book 
to this one guy unless there was something powerful in there for you, right? And so we instructed you to go ahead and read that this week in preparation for our gathering here this morning. And I hope that many of you have. We're only going to read some of it because it would take too long to read all of it. And I know you guys want me to preach longer. But Judges 6 through 8, you can open up a Bible. Go ahead, open up a Bible, open up a Bible. Don't just sit there and look at me. I used to sell cars for a living. You want to know the truth, right? Don't listen to the car salesman. Listen to the, listen to the Lord. You got a Bible in front of you. Use it, right? Use it. Grab one. You should always read the scriptures, right? Because the Bible itself informs us that we should take what the preacher tells us and test it against the word of God, right? You shouldn't make many conclusions. You shouldn't draw many conclusions in the service. Did you know that? You should. See? He agrees. You, 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 you shouldn't draw many conclusions in the service. You know when convictions are formed? When you take some notes like he's doing right there about what I would say and then go home and, and open up your Bible and read it and see if what I'm teaching you is true before you make a decision on that because oftentimes eternity is in the balance, right? You don't want to just make it, hey, that, he made sense. He made sense. It shouldn't make a whole lot of sense right away. Paul called his preaching foolish. If his was foolish, what do you think mine is? So, listen, we're going to, we're going to name this, uh, this message, Mighty Hero, the Lord is with you. These are the words that God spoke to Gideon. Now, in Judges chapter 6, I'm going to go there. I'm going to read the first 12 verses. And this will give you uh, the description of how Gideon's ministry, if you will, started. How his, his interaction with the Lord and how the Lord used him, it starts here. Now, certainly, Gideon does go on to great victories. He's called to lead an army. He's called to lead an army to fight the enemy, and he does go on to some great victories, but what we want to read, what we want to spend time doing today is not to see his great victories, although there are some, and that's why I wanted you to read uh, Judges 6 through 8 to get all of that, but what we want to do is we want to take a little bit more of a Moses and and Rahab perspective, like what, what, what did God have to do, and who was this guy, and how did they work together to get Gideon to the place to actually have some great victories? Because we all want to have great victories, and this little message series is, is, right, is wedged in the middle of preaching through the book of Acts, where God's saying, listen, y'all, be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Right? Go make disciples of all people. And you're like, I got, I'm not qualified for that. Like, who am I? Right? That's the preacher's job. That's a very popular perspective. And I want to bust you out of that. God wants to bust you out of that and make you realize that he can use anybody. When he says go make disciples of all people, he's talking to you. And you can do it, whether you think you can or not. Because i got something i got to share with you. God's word is true. And, and it doesn't matter what you think or feel. That means nothing. Do you understand? What you think and what you feel means nothing. And at some point, God's word must have more weight in your life than the way you think or feel. And that's why we're here in church again today, okay? So listen, uh, Judges chapter 6, we're going to start in verse 1. Are you there? All those with a Bible in their hands say, I'm there. I'm there. Awesome. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. So I just want to like pause there for a second for all the people that have been taught that God, that all destruction, death, and disease are from the enemy, and that God would never do that. Check your theology. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight, so the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. The Midianites were so cruel that the Israelites made hiding places for themselves in the mountains, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, marauders from Midian, Amalek, and the people of the east would attack Israel, camping in the land and destroying crops as far away as Gaza. They left the Israelites with nothing to eat. Let me ask you a question. When the Bible says that that they left the Israelites with nothing to eat, what does it mean? Nothing to eat. Okay. So I would just suggest that we take the word of God literally unless the word of God strongly insists that we should not. Okay? 
It's right there. Okay, so they left them with nothing to eat, taking how many of their sheep and goats and cattle and donkeys? All. So nothing to eat, no livestock, no animals, took all their stuff. The enemy hordes coming with their, li- coming with their livestock, livestock and tents were as thick as locusts. They arrived on droves of camels, too numerous to count, and they stayed until the land was stripped bare. So they they took everything and destroyed what was left. So Israel was reduced to starvation by the Midianites. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. When they cried out to the Lord because of Midian, the Lord sent a prophet to the Israelites. And the prophet said this, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of slavery in Egypt. I rescued you from the Egyptians and from all who oppressed you. I drove out your enemies and gave you their land. I told you, I am the Lord your God. You must not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live. But you have not listened to me. You need to pause there for a second and just let that sink into you. Before we talk about Gideon, think about you. Has the Lord told you some things? Has he promised you some things? Are you obeying his things? Just think about it. Because we can see that sometimes when we don't obey, like any good mom and dad would do, you discipline your kids. So maybe some of the fatigue and maybe some of the frustration and maybe some of the fear that you're living in is a result of your disobedience. Just think about that. Before you think about the, when we get done with this message, man, my, my neighbor, my friend, my sister, my husband needed to hear that. Maybe you need to. You've now listened to me. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree at Ophrah. How many people want to just say Oprah right there, right? I don't know why. I just want to. Let's just do that. No, I can't change the word of God. Permission from the congregation? No. You're a good bunch. See, you've been taught well. I'm just kidding. The angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash of the clan of Abiezer. Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. I'm going to keep reading. Sir Gideon replied, If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. Okay. So there's the beginning. So God had to work with Gideon. And I guess he'll have to work with you and me to get us to a place where we will respond accordingly to the book of Acts that we've been learning about actually going and advancing the kingdom of God. Like, that's your job and you can do it. A lot of us feel like we can't do that. And so Moses felt he couldn't do it, right? But God proved that wrong. And obviously all of us would say, Rahab, the prostitute, like, how does that work? That wouldn't be the person of choice, but God used her. And here again is Gideon. Right Here again is Gideon, and we're going to see some things that God had to kind of peel away and, and overcome, and, and God has to do some things, and, and Gideon has to do some things, and, and we have to work together with the Lord to kind of bust out of this, this, this onion that we're living in, right? This, our life of failure and defeat sometimes, it's like an onion. You've got to peel back all that stuff, get, a, get out from underneath all the layers of, of reasons why I can't do this, God. Why, why it's not my, uh, in my wheelhouse to do it, why I'm not qualified. I can't, you know, powerfully move the kingdom of God like one of those guys. 
And so here's the thing. We, we've talked about, before Michael brought a great message a couple months ago about Gideon. I just want to expand about, on that. And we talked about Gideon and, and like he's this and he's that and that's why I can't do this. But it's more than just Gideon. So here's the, here's the first layer of the onion that you have to pull back. And maybe you have to pull it back too. Gideon had to pull back this expectation of defeat. He had to pull back this expectation of defeat. So, so and I'm going to offend some people right here. Are you ready? Okay. Um, there are, I don't like to use a lot of sports references in church because I think they're pathetic and they're already an idol in people's lives. So I don't want to elevate them at all. But there are certain teams, certain cities, that we just expect them to lose. Right? I, I, let, let's just get it out. Let's just get it out of the way so that Rich can be okay. Okay. First of all, let me before I start listing cities and offend everybody, I want to tell you that I think it's cool to be a real fan. Right? It's easy to be a fan of the Patriots right now because they win every year. I get it. It's not easy to be a, a fan of the Cleveland Browns. Mm. Right? Do they have a team? No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. So usually it's him and Casper over here. I'm getting evil eyes from both sides. But praise the Lord, I'm just saying this. Casper ain't here today. So that, no, I love him. I love him. But, but, but there are certain teams, right? There's the Cleveland Browns. There's the, there's the uh, Cincinnati Bengals. There's the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, right? Now they got Brady and Gronk, and so maybe they're, they might be decent. But, but for years, so, but, but, but maybe not even. Like, the, the Tampa Bay Bucks are the poster child for losers, right? They had a couple of decent seasons back in, like, the 90s when, what's his name, Warren Sapp and those guys were there. There's a couple of decent seasons. I think they went to a Super Bowl, didn't they? Did they win? No. <laughs> right? You, you, look, and then here's my favorite one, the Buffalo Bills. I just hope that my buddy Mark Hyland is watching right now. They're awful, Listen, we're going to talk a little bit more about them. I told him I was going to preach today about a culture of, of defeat, and I'm going to talk about the Buffalo Bills, and you should come to church today. Like, that's the way to attract people to your ministry. But we expect them to lose, right? And, 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 the, and every year, right, if you're one of those real fans, you, start, you have this false, fake thing that says, this is going to be the year. And it's not based on anything real. It's just a hope. Right? And hope is confident expectation. His maybe this year is based on a birthday wish at best with candles. Right? But we think that. But after a certain amount of seasons of defeat, you, the fans, the team, the city, the league, the nation just starts thinking, you know what? They're going to have another bad year. They're going to they're have a losing record again. But the opposite is true, too. There are certain teams like the Patriots, like the Lakers. I think it makes my blood boil to even say that word. I'm from Boston. The Celtics, right? You go to the, gar you go to the garden. You go to the garden, you see all their banners, right? All them banners up there from all their championships, right? They once won 11 championships in 13 years. Years. In 13 years, they won 11 championships, right? People in Boston expect, listen, when they start the season, they're not starting with a hope to have a decent year. When they start the first practice, they're going to win the championship, right? They're, that's just the way it is. When, 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 when the Lakers start the season, same thing. When the Patriots start the season, the same thing. If you're a hockey fan, I don't know, the Montreal Canadiens, it's the same thing. When Tiger Woods steps up on the tee of the first hole of the, of the tournament, he is not there to have a good finish. He is there to win. And, and, and everyone knows that, right? So there's a culture of losing, and there's also a culture of winning, and we see that here in our text here where God is working on this one person. Look at verse 3. Look at it says, Whenever Israel planted a crop, Midian would attack them, take the crop, destroy the crop, take all their sheep, all their goats, all their cattle, and all their donkeys. Right? Whenever. That's a big word there. 
Whenever means every stinking time I try, I get knocked down again. I fail, I try, I fail, I try, I fail, I try. And at some point, you just get into despair. And I've been there. And despair is not, I'm bummed out about something. Despair is, I've tried and tried again, and it never works. It's never going to change. It's never going to get better. And some of us are there. And Gideon lives in that culture. The whole country, that's the way they are. And when you try and try and try, and every single time you lose... The only reasonable response to seemingly endless disappointment and hurt and failure is defense. Right? You're no longer starting your day off with, with the offensive. With move, which I don't even want to try to move forward anymore. I'm not putting together an army to defeat them. I'm not coming up with creative ideas to try to change things. I'm just trying to defend. I'm no longer trying to move forward. I'm just trying to lessen the blow of guaranteed loss. Look at verse 2, you see it there. The Midianites were so cruel that the Israelites made hiding places for themselves in the mountains, caves, and strongholds. You see, we know we're going to lose. We know there's nothing we can do to change the situation. And so we're just trying to hide to soften the blow. It's just what we'd call nowadays just like damage control. Let's just try to make, I know we're going to lose, but let's just make this as, as, let's just have as little pain as possible. Like that would be a victory if it wasn't complete destruction. If we could get out of here with a little bit of food, that would be a win. Not trying to overcome, not trying to get together and have a, a, a think tank to say, hey, how can we change this? How can we move forward? No, we're in a culture of defeat. And that's the, that's the nation that Gideon lived in. Listen, that was the air that they breathed. They breathed losing air. They thought nothing would change. Whenever they plant crops, they were defeated. And some teams, like I said, they're like that. And so Gideon has to live in a culture of defeat. So that's one big layer that has to be pulled back away so that you can actually be released and free to actually do the things that God has called you to do. You might be facing that. Gideon was certainly facing that. Here's the second thing we see in Gideon's life. The second thing, and it's a powerful thing, that God had to work with him to try to peel this thing back and get rid of it so Gideon could get out from underneath that thing to be released to do what God's called him to do. To be a mighty hero, he had to get rid of this. And that is generational defeat. Some people would call it like a generational curse, right? You've heard that said. Look at verse 15. But Lord, Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel my clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh. You see how what he did right there? Now, he'll go on and talk about himself, but he identified himself immediately to his family, to his clan. What they did, he is. No individuality. This is who I am. I'm in a family. And you know, it's not the proud bloodline. It's the defeated bloodline. It's the family that's never done anything, so I'm never going to do anything either. And a lot of us feel that way, you know? It's that generational thing. Well, listen, my great-grandfather was a drunk, and my grandfather was a drunk, and my father was a drunk, so guess what I am? It's just who I am. I'll, I, well, my family's never had two nickels. We've never been the get-up-and-go family that was powerful and had a big platform and had a big voice and very successful and clean and sober. We're just victims of our generational curse. That's who I was. That's who I am. And nothing will ever change. It's the person that you ask, hey, how you doing today? You know what they say? Well, as good as could be expected. <laughs> and if you ever answer me that way, you're going to get that look from me. Really? I thought you were a Christian. I thought, I thought that the Spirit of God lived inside of you. I thought that Jesus said that the enemy came to steal, kill, and destroy, but that I came, then you might have life in abundance. So how are you doing today? I'm awesome. 
You know why? My circumstances suck, but I'm saved. Right? Awesome. Woo! Right? How are you doing today? Great. I'm doing great. We should practice that from now on. From now on, that's what we're going to do in this church. Let's try it right now. How are you doing today? Awesome. Colby, how are you doing today? Great. How about you? How are you doing today? Great. How are you? What about you, Grayson? Great. How about over there? Anyone over there feeling anything today? How are you feeling? Are you doing great? How are you doing today? Oh, there's one in every group. Doing great, but doing great. My circumstances aren't, but I am great, right? I'm saved. Blood bought, baptized, believer in the Lord Jesus who's going to heaven. What's the worst you could do to me? Kill me? Awesome. Send me home early. Okay, so there's a culture of expectation of loss that you can live in. And then there's this whole family tree curse that you think, well, that's what they've done, and so that's what I am. But then there's this third thing, and I would just call this the limitation called me. It's the limitation called me. You can go back to that same verse, verse 15. The Lord, Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least in my entire family. So not only do I live in a losing culture from a losing family, but I've never accomplished much either, personally. I'm not the smartest. I'm not the wealthiest. I'm not the best looking. I'm not the best preacher, teacher, orator, speaker, eloquent in my words, right? Not the best at anything. And as a matter of fact, it seems like everything I try fails. And things don't get better. That's the onion that Gideon lived in. And that might be the onion that you live in. Maybe that's the layers that are on top of you. So when you get to church and you open up the book of Acts and it says, this is the way I want you to respond to who I am. Go tell the world about me. And you're like, I can't. And the, and the excuses start piling on. Boom, 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 boom. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. We all have them, right? Yep. And so here it is. Here's the onion. Here's the layer upon layer of things that are involved in, in, in Gideon's life. Could be you too. That God has to pull those things back so that you can be released to do the things that God has called you to do. And, and listen, when you have all these layers on top of you, it is absolutely, totally understandable to feel this way. I don't want to make light of any of those things. If you've had it tough and you've got tough circumstances that are working against you, it's understandable to feel like you can't do anything. So I said I was going to pick on Buffalo, right? Just think about them for a second. Here's a team that's not prone to winning, and all of a sudden in 1991 they have a really good season, and they go to the Super Bowl. That's really good. So they go to the Super Bowl, and guess what happens? They lose. Okay, okay. Hey, we got to the Super Bowl, though. What about the rest of you guys? You didn't get to the Super Bowl. I got to the Super Bowl. That's awesome. So they're probably pretty happy about that, even though they would have liked to have won. But, but they're probably pretty happy. A lot of teams would have loved to be where they are. So okay, we got to the Super Bowl, but we lost. We'll get them next year. So 92 comes, right? They have another good season. Huh, Wow. And guess what? They get to the Super Bowl again. Two years in a row, they get to the Super Bowl. Most teams could never say that. But guess what happens? They lose again. Oh, man. Do you feel their frustration right now already, just in this room 20 years later? It gets frustrating, right? We made it. We got beat down again. Whenever Israel planted a crop, the Midianites came and destroyed it. Every time I get to the Super Bowl... The other team destroys us. But they sucked it up and they tried it yet again. And so in 1993, guess what? They had another good season. And guess what? They made it to the Super Bowl again. Three years in a row, man. Who can say that? I don't know. I'm not a big sports guy. You'd have to do a little research. Has there ever been a team that's made it three years in a row other than Buffalo? I don't know. But that's really good though, right? Well, guess what happened? They lost. 
again. Like at some point, those players, that city, this league, and this country are starting to, like, it makes sense to start thinking, are we ever going to win? Is, is there any chance it could happen again? Like, could we get there? Well, guess what? In 94, they made it to the Super Bowl again. And guess what happened? They lost. Now, listen, listen. This is why they were on the short list of losers this, when I first started. They can't win, right? Maybe they will someday. I'm not saying. I'm not, I'm not putting a curse on them or nothing. They, they're, they're perfectly capable of doing that themselves, right? They don't need my help. But listen, after that many years of trying and trying and trying, doesn't it make sense that they just start feeling, Man, I, I don't think we're ever going to be able to do this. We've tried. We've done everything we can. And we just lose all the time. And you might feel like that sometimes too about your own life. And trying to see yourself as a person that God could use to powerfully advance the kingdom of God from your life of lose, 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 defeat, defeat. It seems like a far stretch at best. And if we're honest with ourselves, it's more like a, there's really no chance. I'm sure the Buffalo Bills were probably feeling that after that many years of try, lose, try, lose, try, lose. That kind of thinking can sneak in, can't it? And we might feel that way too. But the good news, I've shared this every week now, I'm going to share it again probably every week during this six, seven week thing, is 1 Samuel 16, 7. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. You see? And this is the kind of transformation that needs to take place in the mind of the believer. You have to stop thinking that because you've failed so often in the past that you can't win in the future. You have to get that out of your mind. Here's the thing. The way you feel, this is truth, the way you feel has no bearing on who God chooses. Do you understand that? The way you feel, look, and I'm not talking about the way you feel about yourself either. You might think, well, I don't like him. There's no way God would use this guy. And I don't like myself, so there's no way God could use this guy. Right? It's for everybody. The way you think, of, no one could, God could never use my sister, my brother, my mom, my dad, my friend, my next door neighbor, my boss, that criminal in jail. No one. God couldn't use that guy. You need to stop thinking that way because when God chooses a man or a woman, it's not because you qualified yourself. It's because that's what he wants to do. He doesn't see things the way you see them. His thoughts are not your thoughts. His ways are not your ways. He doesn't see things the way you see them. And so you see this guy Gideon who's in a culture of defeat, in a family of losers, and he himself has done nothing with his life, and watch what happens. The Lord goes to him. The Lord goes to Gideon and says these seven awesome words. Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. That's what he says to Gideon, who's done absolutely nothing to warrant those words. See, we identify and call ourselves by our current situation or our past, but the Lord calls us by our potential. Do you hear that? Let that sink in. We call ourselves by our past, but the Lord calls us by our potential. And He sees things in you and I that you don't see of yourself. God does not see things the way you do. Look, look at verse 14. Look at what it says there. What does He say? Verse 14, then the Lord turns to, to Gideon and says this, go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. Now think about this. Think about not just Gideon and how low he thinks of himself, but look at the description that the word of God has about Midian. Hordes of camels, thick as locusts. How many soldiers 
And war horses did they have? A lot. A, a vast army, right? A vast army that year after year is coming in and destroying everything Israel has. So, so, so just think about this. Here's this little dude. So two things happen here. He realizes how little he is, and he realizes how big his opponent is. And that's a massive chasm, right? And we probably find ourselves in that, with that chasm before us when you look at the book of Acts and, say, and he says, go do this, change the world, make my plea through your voice, be my agent of reconciliation, go be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. And you're like, me? How can I do that? How do we get a church mobilized to do this when that's the way we feel about ourselves? And Gideon feels that way too. This massive army, and, and God says to Gideon, go with the strength you have and rescue your nation. The strength that I have? I just told you about the strength I have. You know how much strength I have? This much. My country is losers. My family are losers, and I am a loser. I can't do anything. I'm the weakest in my whole family. I'm incapable of doing this. And he says, go with the strength you have. Go with the strength you have. See, the problem is that when, you know, we see when he says that? We see me. When you look in the, when, when he says, go with the strength you have, you're thinking about you, right? The strength you have. But see, when God says that, go with the strength you have, he doesn't see me. He sees us. He sees us. See, it's true that you and I are a big bucket of mistakes. We've all made massive mistakes and failure. I, I get all that. But God says this, mighty hero, go with the strength I gave you. I am with you. God says, I am with you. See, the, the, I am the one who spoke the universe into existence. I am the one who, who, who raised people from the dead. I am the one who knit you together in your mother's womb. I am your shield and I am your strength. And I am your ever-present help. And I am your provider. And I am the truth. And I am the way. And I am the resurrection, right? And all that I am is with you. And so it's not you, right? It's us. It's me and you. So when he says, go with the strength that you have, he's saying, I am the strength that you have. Amen. And that's the strength that breathed the planets into existence. You have plenty of strength. Amen. Plenty of strength. So, so look at verse uh, 634. Look at it says. 634 says, Then the Spirit of the Lord took possession of Gideon. That's why you have strength. Because the Spirit of the Lord took possession of Gideon. And so the one that's in despair, poor old Gideon, becomes a mighty hero because Gideon allowed God to work powerfully in and through his life. And it's not because Gideon or you or I become super awesome at the word of the Lord. Hey, you're a hero. I'm a hero now. No, what made Gideon a mighty hero is that God was working through him. God was working through him. He says, go with the strength I have given you, I will be with you. Look at verse, uh, go to chapter 7 for a moment, and look, let's look at the first seven verses. So, so Jeroboam, that's Gideon, and his army got up early and went as far as the spring of Herod. The armies of Midian were camped north of them in the valley near the hill of Morah. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many warriors with you. If I let all of you fight the Midianites, the Israelites will boast to me that they saved themselves by their own strength. You see that? What did he say? Go with the strength you have. But God says, I don't want you to boast about your strength. This is all about God working through someone, not how awesome you are. That's right. He says, they'll, they'll brag about how and uh, boast about their strength. Therefore, tell the people... Tell them this, whoever is timid or afraid may leave this mountain and go home. So 22,000 of them went home, leaving only 10,000 who were willing to fight. So there was 32,000 soldiers that he had. So he calls this guy to lead. 32,000 people say, I'll follow you. What's he, might, he might be thinking, hey, 
I might be pretty awesome after all, right? Look at all these people. And 22,000 of them bail. But that wasn't enough. But the Lord told Gideon, there's still too many. <laughs> Gideon's like, <"Really?" laughs> Do you ever feel that way? Man, I try something? Really? 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 The Lord says, still too many. Bring them down to the spring, and I will test them to determine who will go with you and who will not. Talk about his thoughts are not our thoughts, and his ways are not our ways. Watch this one. When Gideon took his warriors down to the water, the Lord told him, divide the men into two groups. In one group, put all those who cup water in their hands and lap it with their tongues like dogs. In the other group, put all those who kneel down and drink with their mouths in the stream. So like actually down into the water. Only 300 of the men drank from their hands. All the others got down on their knees and drank with their mouths in the stream. The Lord told Gideon, with these 300 men, I will rescue you and give you victory over the Midianites. Send all the others home. So now is a great place for a pause. Now is a great place for a pause to inform you that the only one true super, superhero of, of God's story that's found in the Bible is God. He's the only superhero in all of Scripture. The main sentence, the main verse I want you to see here is verse 7. He says, I will give you victory and I will rescue you. Right? I will rescue you. I will give you victory. So that's the reason why Gideon could be a mighty hero is because the great I am was with him fighting for him and giving him the rescue and giving him the victory. It was not something that he and his soldiers were able to accomplish. And as a matter of fact, if you do read Judges 6 through 8, one of the most incredible battles in the history of the human race takes place right there. The enemy starts fighting themselves. They kill each other. So Israel doesn't even have to go do it. They had to chase down the leaders and, and Gideon killed him. He became tough. But God won the victory. God caused the enemy to fight amongst themselves. Had people licking out of streams, speaking out of a burning bush. Have you got the picture yet that his ways are not our ways? And the way you think is hardly ever the case. That you can't qualify yourself. God chooses whom he wants to have serving him to do great things. Okay, do you understand that that could be you? He could speak out of, out of this chair right now. And it seems like a crazy illustration. But I'm sure that if you had told those people back then that he's going to, hey, watch this, he's going to speak out of that bush. They would have thought the same thing of that Moses, that he's crazy. And I'm telling you, he could speak right out of that chair right now and call you to the ministry. He could do that. That's what God does. Okay? So here's the good news. The Holy Spirit took possession of Gideon. And God was with him because of this. And God brought the rescue. And God brought the victory. And the good news is this. Is that you're all sinners, and I am too. And because of our sin, we have, we have separated ourselves from a holy God. But because Jesus Christ is God himself, he came down from heaven, he lived a perfect sinless life, and then he went to the cross to pay for your sin so that in him you could be the righteousness of God. And because you said yes to that free gift, it says in Ephesians 1.13 that he gave you his Holy Spirit the moment that you believed. The great I am is not just with Gideon, he's with you. Do you understand that, right? And this, this spirit that he gave you, Romans 8, 11 says, it's the same spirit of God that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. That spirit lives inside of you. So the power of God is not just next to you. It's not just near you. It's in you. Do you understand? It doesn't get any closer. The great I am can't be with someone more than that. He is living inside of you. Amen. Do you understand this? 
That, that's why you can be used, right? That's why you can be used. If you've repented of your sin and, and turned to God and embraced Jesus Christ by faith to be your Lord and Savior, then His Spirit that, that took possession of Gideon is inside of you. And maybe He's calling you the same as He called Gideon, and He would call you a mighty warrior, that the Lord is with you. God is calling forth your potential. He's calling forth His own Spirit that's in you. He's calling himself to himself and asking you to do great things. He's, he's calling forth the gifting that he's given you when his spirit took rest inside of you. He's calling you out from underneath all the levels of failure, all the family disappointment and history of failure, and all your personal weaknesses and failures too, because his spirit is in you, believer. That's the truth. His spirit is in you, and you know what? That makes you dangerous. His spirit in you makes you dangerous. His spirit inside of you makes you powerful. His spirit in you means that you've been gifted and given abilities to do some powerful things to advance the kingdom of God, no matter who you are and what you've done. Because that stuff doesn't qualify you for kingdom work. His spirit in you does. His gifts in you does. Right? That's the truth. His spirit in you means that you're under His authority and his mandate to make disciples of all people. Let me ask you a question, loved ones. How much room is there to breathe for the believer to not make disciples? Show me. There's no room. No room to not make disciples of Jesus Christ. If you have been saved and his spirit lives in you, He's calling you out right now to advance his kingdom and make disciples of all people. It's time to come out of hiding and let the Lord leverage your life for his glory. That's why you live. That's why you breathed. You were saved for more than heaven. You were saved so God can make his plea through you. So you can be his voice to a lost, defeated, and scared people that are in your life. That right now, more than ever I've ever seen, they're simply existing. They're not living. And people need Jesus Christ now more than ever. Amen. And as persecution comes, and, and our country that we live in changes, and it gets more confrontational to the things of our faith... Jesus said they're going to hate you because they hate him. And we need to understand, every single follower of Jesus Christ needs to understand that you are part of an army to go make disciples and advance his kingdom now. Not last week, not next week, now, right? You advance his kingdom now. If he's put his spirit inside of you, that's your job. God chose a nobody in Moses, a fugitive, felon in Moses, a shepherd. He chose Rahab, the prostitute. And here, he chose a lowly, scaredy cat named Gideon, who was living in a culture of defeat from a family of defeat and personal defeat and he called him forth and said mighty hero go with the strength you have and free my people and listen loved ones Jesus came to set the captives free and you were once one of them and who the son sets free is free indeed and we have reason to rejoice because of that, right? But there are a lot of people in your world that you know that can't rejoice in the same thing. And you're the voice of reconciliation. He's given us this ministry of reconciliation. That God makes his plea through you. If you've been set free, then you and only you might have the key to someone who you know or love so they can be released from the prison that they're in. And God needs you to step up and use the strength that you have. His spirit in you that raised Christ from the dead 
to go make disciples? Could he, cho- could he possibly be choosing, could he be changing the shirt from Gideon to you? Could it say your name on that shirt? Might that be you here this morning? And here, listen, you know what? In closing, the question isn't, who are you? The question really is, who is he? Because this is who he is, and this is what he does. So listen, no one that God has ever chosen to do his work has ever been qualified to do so. They've never been smart enough, good looking enough, strong enough, creative enough, all that to do the work of the ministry, to be agents of reconciliation. God chose them because that's who he wanted to use. And so could he be calling you this morning just as he called Gideon? Might he say, mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Could it be? Could he be saying that about you, Carl? Could he be saying that about you? Could he be saying that about you? Maybe. Does the spirit live inside of you? Does it? Then couldn't he be calling you? Couldn't he be calling you? Could he be calling you, Rich? Could be. Our job here today is to hear his voice. So let's take a moment and let this guy shut up. And let's just see if maybe the Lord will call you just like he's called Gideon. Maybe he'll call you now. Let's just get quiet. felt very compelled of the Lord yesterday to share communion this morning. Communion is an amazing time. It's a precious time that God's given us to, to, in a fresh way, a lot of things, but sense that closeness. The word communion itself, to commune, to be one, to be close, right? To be near. And the Spirit of God that lives in you, that's so near, but a time to reflect on that, to think about that, to ponder that, that the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. So these guys right now, they're going to just come through the room and they're going to give out communion to you. I'd ask you to hold on to those elements for just a moment. Then we're going to take them together as a family, okay? But be thinking as you're receiving this stuff now, be thinking about, has, is God calling me? Is God calling me? Has he been calling me and I've been disobedient? Is he calling me? Is he saying, you're a mighty hero? Is he saying, I see great potential in you to be used of the kingdom of God and, and, and you're being called right now?
So Lord, the only reason we would ever hear your call is not because of who we are, but because of who you are. That your spirit would dwell inside of us would have the ability to have ears to hear you. Your word says that my sheep know my voice and they follow me. That's an amazing privilege to hear your voice. And we have a reason to celebrate and be thankful for that, Lord. So there's so many things that could be said here at the communion table. But that you went to the cross that you would die, that we might live, that you would be willing to take up residence inside of us. Gideons, Rahabs, Moses, me, that you would do that is an incredible gift. Lord, are you calling me? Is that your voice I hear? Was this message for me? Are you calling me to holiness? Are you calling me to purity? Are you calling me to obedience? Are you calling me to mission? you want me to do, God? The Lord Jesus tells us that each time we take communion, we should do it in remembrance of him. So Lord, we're just grateful right now that we could yet again refocus our thoughts and our eyes on you. So prone to wander from that, Lord, we are. So prone to leave the God I love. But grateful, Lord, that in my tendency to wander, you call me back to fix my eyes on you again. Lord, we thank you for your sacrifice. And Lord, we take this bread now represents your body that you willingly laid down that you gave of yourself that we might live we take that bread to remember this and how we take the cup the cup is amazing because the cup fulfills one of your laws that we could never fulfill. You said without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. We should be on that cross. I should be on that cross. But you went on that cross and you spilt your blood for the forgiveness of sin take this drink now to thank you for that. And now, Lord, we realize that those of us that have been set free and are free indeed, we realize now in that awareness also comes the awareness, like we said earlier, that there are many that are not. And these are the ones you've placed us into their world. And you've placed us into this church so that our church, our family, could be a beacon of hope, could be a city on a hill, could be the salt of the earth, to be that voice crying out in this wilderness the way for the Lord and bring Jesus to this lost and hurting world and it's to that effect Lord that's the reason why we give 
So Lord, I would just ask that you'd speak to your people again. And tell us all now, personally, what does generosity and thankfulness and partnership with you look like in giving so that our church can continue to be a light to this community and beyond.